Now, we're very happy to tell you about the All-Ireland Cycle. It's taken place between August 28th and the 6th of September. At the All-Ireland Cycle, it's now in its 10th year. It's been going a long time. And once again, it's helping to raise funds for the National Breast Cancer Research Institute. So what we're doing or what they're doing is county versus county. There's going to be a leaderboard and you're able to see each county's kilometre total grow between August 28th and September 6th every time a cyclist logs their distances. And uh, the call is very much to get you on your bike and in doing so uh, to support breast cancer research. And the place to go for all information, to register, to get involved, be it friends, family, people around the country that you know, go to allirelandcycle.ie. It's for a really good cause. It might get you fit as well. And Paul Early, who you'll know, obviously, GA fans, is uh, with us. Paul, this is a, a charity cycle initiative you've been involved in for some time now. That's right, Joe. Um, we set it up about 10 years ago. So this was going to be our 10th anniversary cycle. Initially, it was an eight-day event. We used to cycle the, the route of the Ross on the day of the Ross. So we used to cycle ahead of the professional cyclists. Um, and do the full eight days in the first three or four years. We call the cycle Race the Ross. And the focus was on, at the time, it was on getting former kind of sports people, maybe like myself, who had finished playing, was out of shape, um, and had something to target to get fit, as you said, a bit of health and well-being, fitness, and also contribute to, to a worthy cause and contribute to charity. And we decided early on that we wanted to contribute to uh, cancer research. And over the years, then, that has kind of morphed into a, uh, a different type of event. The eight days became too hard, Joe, because <laughs> the, tra the training was, uh, for, for those of us who had never cycled before, we had to cycle kind of an average of 160 kilometers a day and try and keep ahead of the, the, the Ross. Yeah. That was pretty challenging. So over the years, uh, the, the numbers diminished, let's put it that way, and uh, it became uh, an event for serious cyclists. Anyway, we... we we changed it into the Pink Ribbon Tour, which was a three-day event the last couple of years, uh, a, a more leisure, leisure sporty, if you like, for different levels of cyclists. And that was really successful. This was going to be our third year. Obviously, circumstances dictated that we couldn't run it this year. So we decided, look, we, we wanted to continue, maintain the momentum of this particular event. And uh, we got our heads together, the committee, and decided uh, on this All Ireland Cycle concept, um, it's novel, it's different. It's um, we've been working hard over the last couple of weeks. I have to say, we've got fantastic support Great. for it. So uh, still a bit nervous uh, about it because it's new, but the support has been tremendous, and uh, looking forward to it now. So it's around July, August time every year that you get the six pack back, is it? <laughs> I've never had a six pack, Joe. <laughs> um, but we used to look. What I found was that. Um, and indeed, uh, talking to a lot of sports people, whether they're GA or other sports, when you play for at a high level, you have something to focus on. You have a goal, and you train for that. When you stop playing, you retire. You you lose that focus. And what we found was this particular event was great. You know, it was the end of the season, kind of September time. We moved it to September, so it meant then that throughout the summer months, when the weather was good, you could train for something, mm. uh, which was a worthwhile cause a win-win, you're getting fitter yourself and you're also contributing to charity as well. So that was the aim. And I think from talking, as I said, to a lot of uh, former sports people, they like that concept. They, they work well when they have a, a goal to achieve. And that's, uh, that's certainly benefited me also. I always remember George Best in his later years, he was asked, what did he miss most about the, you know, playing football? And a very interesting answer. He said he really missed being fit, you know? And yeah. unbeknownst to himself, he, he put his hand on his stomach, you know, he's a, he's, and he was, you know, talked about wake, waking up in the morning and a, and a pat there and feeling fit. And I'd say sports people, yeah. if you've been at a great level, it must be one of the aspects that you do miss, that sense of power and fitness and good health, picky your power stuff. Absolutely. And I think the other thing is, you know, when you're part of a team, you're, you have a goal in mind, you have a common goal, mm -hmm. you're training with a group of um, teammates who a lot of whom become friends over the years and then you know you're you're trying to achieve something yeah, obviously you're setting the barrier high you're trying to achieve something often you don't achieve what mm. you set out to achieve but it's that you know getting to that level of fitness and uh, and, and that camaraderie uh, and working together you miss that sometimes certainly when you when you finish sport yeah. and uh, and it's hard to replicate that 
I have to say. Uh, and you try to find, and I'm sure lots of other people who played sport, try to find something different to try and kind of replicate that. But it is difficult. Mm. And why this particular charity, Paul? Is it close to your heart? It, it, well, it is. I think, again, when we, when we started back 10 years ago, um, there were kind of three of us mainly who were kind of pushing it. Eamon Moore Hurthy, Michal's son, who's a close friend of mine, a physio. Mm. Eamon came up with the concept of the, the race, the Ross. Deck Darcy, who uh, you know, went on to, to bigger and, and better things over the last few years. Uh, Dex's younger sister, Sinead, was, was diagnosed with, with cancer and, and she passed away in the first year. Um, Eamon had a, um, a physiotherapist in his practice who was diagnosed with cancer. At the same time, my own brother Dermot had passed away in the previous year. Um, and we all kind of wanted to do something um, of an endurance nature. Uh, to support, I suppose, or in memory of those people, and to support um, the work on, 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 in particular, in research. So, um, so for the last number of years, we've supported the National Breast Cancer Research Institute. It's it's headed by Professor Michael Curran. Uh, I knew Michael from my time years ago in in Galway. Uh, a clear man, a fantastic um, sports enthusiast, great hurling su supporter, and Michael's done phenomenal work in, in building the, the National Breast Cancer Research Institute over the last number of years. And indeed, the scientists and the medical staff who are in there who are contributing to, you know, the fight against cancer. And I think we thought, and we had long kind of discussions early on in the, in the group about who we would support. And we said, right, anything that is research driven and where we know that the funds that we raise will go directly to research. Uh, and, and to make a difference. And that's, I suppose, why, why um, we got involved over the last number of years in, in that particular charity. Okay, very good. Well, listen, we wish you well with it. Paul, seeing as it's a rainy night and there's not much going on, can I push you for a moment for a trip down memory lane? Sure. Okay, because information on you is few and far between. I, you obviously keep, keep things relatively private. I was looking, is there a big Paul Early interview anywhere? And there isn't really. So... Uh, am I right in saying you're about 14 years behind Dermot? Uh, which Dermot is that now? Dermot Senior. <laughs> <laughs> 17 behind Dermot Senior. Is it 17? Right, okay. 17, almost, almost 17. So he, I think, he must have been playing for Roscommon as long as you could remember. Absolutely. Uh, he started, I think, in 1965. That's right, he did. He yeah, did, 65. Yeah. That was his first year. I was going to say if my memory serves me correct, but I was one at the time. Um, <laughs> he, was, he was 17 then. He was 17 then. That's right. So, you know, all my years growing up, he was playing for us, Common. Mm. And did you and the family go and watch him? Was that a thing that could be done back in the day? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I remember traveling with my mum and dad uh, to games all over the place. Um, and I think my first big memory of a big game was um, the, the uh, Connacht final in 1972 in Castlebar. Roscommon played Mayo on a glorious, one of those wonderful hot days, summer days, and um, uh, Roscommon won 5-8, I think it was to 3-10. Um, uh, that was the first title they'd won for a number of years and uh, after getting close on a number of occasions. So that's the first big game I remember. But we used to travel all over the country watching league games, uh, championship games. And um, look, when you come from West Roscommon, there's not a lot else to do other than play football uh, from a sporting point of view. Certainly around then, there were no other sports you could play. Uh, yeah. And uh, obviously when you had a brother who was at that level, uh, you know, it, it was inevitable that you were going to get involved in that, in that, uh, in that game. Am I right in saying your father was a national school principal? He was, yeah. Okay. National school principal. He uh, passed away when I was 18. He, um, he was involved in everything. He was involved in politics. He was a local peace commissioner. He <clears throat> was one of the founder members of our local GA club, Michael Glavies. In fact, the, the ground is named after him, the Pather Early Memorial Park. Uh, he ran the dance hall for the... Uh, for the parish, which was just down the road, uh, took the collections at the masses on the Sunday. Uh, whatever had to be done, he was he was involved in, and generally leading it. Wow, uh, a, a fantastic role model, I have to say. He sounds like it. And what kind of disposition was he? What kind of fellow was he? What kind of fellow? He he actually played handball. That was his game. And you know, I remember him telling me stories about he used to cycle 
He was born, he was born in Laherdon, and then his parents died very, very young. I think mother died when he was five, father at 14. So he moved to Castlebar then, was, was reared by, by relatives. Um, and um, so he was very much a, a go-getter. He was very um, uh, self-sufficient uh, in, in many ways. Um, always thinking of others as well. Did an awful lot of work for unseen work to help others. Um, but he told me stories where he used to cycle, you know, 50, 60, 70 miles from Mayo to kind of Sligo and into Donegal even further for, to play handball when he was a young lad. Uh, went to school in Ring, um, became a fluent Irish teacher, um, and, um, but instilled a great love of, of, of sport and that kind of sense of generosity as well in, in, in giving. Um, so and he passed away very, I suppose he passed away at 67, um, but I was 18, youngest in the family, and it was, um, you know, you had to grow up pretty quickly uh, mm. because, you know, he, he, was, he was always there and going to games and influence you, influencing me at the games. Um, he was the coach, he was the driver, there weren't too many cars, he was dri driving all the kids to the games, and, uh, and then he was gone very early, you know. Jeez, he sounds like Superman. And I, he was, he was, fantastic. Yeah. You never expect someone who's so vibrant and so busy to suddenly disappear like that. Well, that's it, that's it. No, he had health issues before, and he had a heart attack maybe 20 years before that. And um, he was, a, as you say, he was a principal of the primary school. He retired at, what, what it was, 65, maybe 66. And I often think nowadays, you know, I'm in a financial business and we often, you know, we give people retirement advice and, all the evidence suggests that you know you need to have something to replace the work that you do um, for 40 years or 30 or 40 years of your life. You need to have something to replace that. You, you need to have um, a purpose and you need to keep your mind and your body active. And I think back and I remember when he did retire, there was nothing else. And I often think that maybe his mind became inactive and that contributed as well to the, to the health issues. Hmm. Uh, that he had. I think it's obviously it's much different now. Um, people plan ahead, plan for their retirement. Uh, they keep many people keep working. They keep active. They do other things. But uh, that was back in 1983. It was it was quite different then. Yeah, it's amazing how much things have changed so quickly. So there was you and there was Dermot, 17 years ahead of you. And how many siblings in between? Uh, Peter is in between us. Uh, Peter is, um, he was born in 1956, whatever that makes him now, 64. So Peter was in between. And then I had two older sisters. One is in Sydney for over 40 years. Another, Denise and Margaret's in London. She's there yeah, for most of her life as well. Okay. So um, there were just the five of us. I was the youngest. I think Peter was next. So there was eight years between, between myself and Peter. So, okay. um, yeah. So you were the spoiled baby. And so watching, uh, <laughs> watching Dermot playing then and, and with not much else to do and your dad obviously, you know, uh, very involved in, in community and the football team. So I presume you're watching Dermot going around to these matches with the family and thinking, well, this is for me. I mean, Jesus, sign me up as, as quick as possible. Look, absolutely. And, and again, with dad been involved in the, G, the local GA club as well. Um, you know, it was obviously inevitable that I was going to get Get heavily involved in the game and and, and, and play play Gaelic football. So um, and I suppose Dermot at the time was was you know I won't say at his peak because it, I think he, he stayed at his peak for quite a number of years. But um, you know he was he was box office if you like mm. even from a very young age he was the star of the Roscommon team. Um, I can't remember. I think he won his first All Star maybe in nineteen seventy four. I think it was about 74, I think, yeah, and 79 was the second one. Uh, so he, he was, um, you know, he, he, he was star materially then when there were very few stars around. Um, yeah. And in, what, in the was that, why was that, Paul? Was that, big, you know, his style of play and he's got the good looks and the dark hair and he kind of caught the eye? What was it about him, do you think? I think it was, it was a combination of things. I think he, he was, um, obviously, he was very talented. He worked incredibly hard in his game. The, the style of game that he played as well in the middle of the field, he always played with passion. It was that kind of um, fire that he brought, that determination that he brought, never say die attitude, even when things weren't going so well for Roscommon in those days. Mm. You know, his ability to kick long frees, um, 
his ability to drop kick the ball, which obviously isn't a feature of the modern game, but he scored many great scores, drop kicking the ball against the wind from 45, 50 metres out. Um, uh, the high catch, even though he wasn't the tallest, he was six foot, but he could get off the ground. His leap was phenomenal. And he had those, he had those legs like tree trunks. I remember when I joined the Roscommon Senior Panel, you know, I obviously um, knew how, how strong he was. But then I met another guy, Harry Keegan, who played for Roscommon for years, cornerback, and his, his, uh, his thighs were even bigger. So I thought, my God, what's, uh, what's Harry doing? But, um, but he, had, he, he had that, it was the way he played but it was also the quality that he brought to the game as well, I think. Um, that endeared himself to, 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 to um, many supporters and indeed other players as well. And I suppose he had also had a, a, an attitude of play the game fairly, play the game in the right spirit. And, you know, over the years, particularly when he finished playing, you know, he'd been invited to, to speak and launch many things in different counties. Um, uh, by you know, adversaries, um, former opponents, you know, who he would compete hard against in those games, um, but they all had an incredibly high respect for him mm. um, because he played the game hard, but he played the game very fairly. He would never do anything uh, underhand and, um, or dirty, whatever you like to call it, um, to an opponent. And, mm. and that was his philosophy. And mm. I think that's, that's endeared him to so many people. Is the story right that he was carried off the field in his last game? Yeah, it is. In 1985, kind of final. My first, uh, my first kind of final. You got an all star uh, that you got an all star that year. Yeah, um, Mayo Mayo beat us comprehensively on on the day. Fully deserved their victory, uh, but it was again a measure of what I've just said. The respect that you know the cl- our closest, I suppose. Foles over those years, um, um, three, four players at the end of the game having won their Connacht title, uh, and Mayo hadn't won a Connacht title for a few years, uh, had the presence of mind and the thoughtfulness to um, carry Dermot off the field. Uh, Eugene Lavin, Henry Gavin, Willie Joe Padden were among the, that group. And um, you know, I remember when I was growing up, I went to school in Ballyhonas and Mayo. And for the five years I went to school, Roscommon mm-hmm. were in the ascendancy, 1977 to 1980. Uh, I don't think Mayo beat them during those f- four years. So when I went to school in Mayo, I don't think I ever witnessed a Roscommon loss against Mayo. Now, when I played subsequently in the, the years from 85 to 90, uh, the trend was reversed quite, uh, quite dramatically. But... Um, but that was again a measure of the the respect that people that players had for him um, mm. on his final day, and um, that, that that gesture, I have to say, would, will by those Mayo players will never be forgotten in in our household, in our family. No, I wouldn't think so. It's the most gorgeous thing to do. Who were the names you mentioned again? Willie Joe. Willie Joe was there. Henry Gavin, Casabar, Eugene Lavin. Um, there were there are three that come to mind, um, and, and I think there were, there were others as well. Um, but they were the three that that hoisted him off the field that day. And um, iconic. Oh, it was special. It was yeah. iconic, absolutely yeah. iconic. Yeah. And what was he like as a brother then? with you coming through? Very supportive, but he, you have to remember again. You know that age gap meant that he was in the army. He was in in Newbridge, living in Newbridge in the Cora. You know, wasn't home that much. Obviously, um, I was still a kid going to school. But incredibly supportive and and encouraging, uh, all through you know my development years, if you like, and um, um, and I did get the opportunity, obviously, to play with him that year. I, I played in maybe two years earlier before I went away to Australia, or mm-hmm. three years earlier with him as well. So I got a few games uh, with him, which was great. Yeah, and uh, you kind of cherish those memories, even though he was coming to the end of his career. Uh, just the opportunity to, to get in the play, on the field with somebody you looked up to, uh, obviously as a brother, but as a hero uh, as well. Among other players in the Roscommon team, like that 1977 to 1980 team was a fantastic um, team. And I had the privilege to play with a number of them. You know, as I mentioned, Harry, Pat Lindsay, Seamus Hayden, Jerry Fitzmaurice, Tony McManus for you know, a number of years and, and others. And, um, you know, they were, they were all heroes when I was a, a young guy. And... It was fantastic. But Dermot, great support over the years, even though there was that big age gap between us. Mm. It's a very special thing to be able to call your brother a hero. I mean, we all love our brothers and get on our brothers, but I, you know, I don't think many of us would call them our heroes either, you know. Um, but I, I can yeah. see how he, how he was for you. 
I was even just saw on your Twitter feed recently, you retweeted, uh, I think it was Roscommon GA, just marking the 10 year anniversary of his passing. Does mm-hmm. it feel like 10 years? Does it feel longer? I mean, it's, it's, it, it's such a dreadful thing to happen. It, it doesn't feel like 10 years, no. And um, it's remarkable. You know, in the first couple of years, Joe, there was hardly a day that went by, went by that somebody didn't come up to me and mention something. Um, that they had, you know, met Dermot somewhere, that they had um, been influenced him in, by him in some way. And, you know, whether that is just a handshake, he had this very powerful handshake and this ability to make the person that he was with at the time feel they were the most important person. And that was always very genuine. Um, but um, I, I remember, uh, you know, somebody saying to me that when they heard the news that he passed away, they, even though they'd never met him, they stopped the car on the side of the road and, and had, a, had a tear, had a little cry, mm. um, because they had heard so much about him and they looked up to him so much. And, and that continues. Obviously, it lessens as over the last couple of years, but the respect is still there. And, you know, for his work in the army, as well as obviously uh, his uh, contribution on the GEA field. So... It doesn't feel like 10 years. We, we try and keep the memory alive. There are lots of little events that, that are run throughout the year. Um, there's the Dermot Early Leadership Programme, which uh, for Oiga, Crow Park and, and the GA for Oiga uh, are involved in, and that's great. It's about you know, youth, youth leadership. It's a youth leadership programme, uh, and that's um, run and promoted and, and, and managed by, by them and supported by the family, uh, Dermot's uh, children and, and Mary, his wife. Mm. Uh, so his, you know, we try to keep the memory alive, but I don't think it will ever go because there are so many people who have had such a, a high regard for him. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I had caused before even I knew, knew you were coming on a couple of weeks ago. I was having to play just a random game of golf with someone who had worked with him in the army, and they were singing his praises. You know, I don't know how it came up. You know, yourself across three, four hours, but yeah. it came up and made, just made a point of saying this was a special person to work for. You know, like. Yeah. There's no, there's no degree of um, uh, kind of uh, uh, exaggerating the effect he seemed to have on pe- people now that he's passed away, which you know can sometimes happen very naturally and for nice reasons. It was, it was a clear yeah. point that this was a really special person. Absolutely, um, no doubt about that. And um, and I think the most important thing is from listening to a lot of people is that he just made people feel good about themselves yeah that and, was you know if, if, if you if you can do that if you can leave people feeling a bit more positive and upbeat uh, as a result of your interaction with them well then in the environment that we live in at the moment you know you've done a good job and i think and i keep using the word it was it, it, it wasn't done it was done with all sincerity and and with a, a genuineness mm. at all times mm. and you know even through the in the army you know, many, many people who were soldiers in the army would have said that, you know, there was never any sense of, uh, if you like, class distinction uh, with Dermot when he talked. He could, he could be talking to the president of Ireland and he could be talking to, talking to the, the soldier, the 18 year old who's just joined the army. And he gave them the same level of attention and the same level of importance in terms of the interaction. Did you ever think about the army, Paul? Um, not really. No, not really. Um, uh, even though obviously it would have been pro- pro- probably a natural progression, um, but um, no, didn't really think about it seriously um, at the time. Um, as I said, the it was unusual again. The interactions that I had with Dermot when I was growing up were um, infrequent because I'd meet him at the games, and obviously then you know the odd the odd weekend he'd be at home. Um, but um, uh, Thought about it for a while, but it didn't 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 overly appeal to me. Yeah, you wanted the cushy life, and nice office, well, and coffee. Absolutely, and... <laughs> absolutely. Look, looking back, the ability to retire. I think the army guys can retire after what um, twenty years, is it? Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, then, and many of them have moved on and, and left the army and moved into different things. Uh, they've been a wrong decision, but. And, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it a cushy life job, but anyway, a different no, life. No, 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 a different life, a different life, of course. And so you, you, your father sounded like an extraordinary man. I, I presume that the rock of the family then is, is your mother. Is she, was she going to games as well? Was that the done thing back then? Oh, she was going to games and, well, she went to the games, um, <laughs> but she would end up in the church. She'd rarely go to a game. She'd go to the church and her... Um, um, uh, 
principal, I suppose, um, focus was on, she, she would say, uh, a prayer that Dermot wouldn't get injured and that he wouldn't injure anybody. So that was her mindset. And she rarely went to the games. Um, and uh, she would sew the, 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 the four-leaf clover, three-leaf, four-leaf clover into the, into the seam of the shorts as well. So we all, we all, um, uh, we all wore those. <laughs> well, um, literally, literally yeah. she would do that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, she was, um, she was, a, she was from Mayo. But, but, but my father and mother were from Mayo. My mother came from a, a, a Castle Bar, a great, a great, um, subsequently a great GAA household because she came from a, a, a pub in Castle Bar. There, her, her parents owned a pub, Burns in Main Street, and it's run by my first cousin Mick. And Mick is a legend, legendary Mayo supporter. Um, and uh, you might have heard of the Burns Babes. Burns Babes, there's a bunch of them who travel to all Mayo games okay. uh, all over the country and indeed all over the world. Uh, and Mick has certainly had the, the green and red Volkswagen uh, for a number of years. I think he probably still has it. So uh, passionate about football, passionate about Mayo football. But that's where my mother was, came from. So came from Mayo. As I said, most of the games that we had in Connacht when I was growing up were, you know, obviously Roscommon versus Galway or Roscommon versus Mayo. So there was always a little bit of conflict in the household. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, she rarely went to a game. Too, ner too nervous, Joe. Too, too nervous. nervous. Yeah, well, she, she had a good perspective on the whole thing. Once they're happy and healthy and everyone's healthy, isn't that the most important thing? Um, so, exactly. I mean, famously, obviously, you, you had a sliding doors moment in Australia and you were over in the old VFL League. It was, nice, was that Victorian Football League with yeah, Melbourne and you right. played, a, played a game with Melbourne. So you were the first to go, which was a big deal at the time. How big a sliding doors moment is this? Were you close to staying or did you want to come home or how, how did all that finish or not quite get off the ground maybe? Well, yeah, I was very close to staying. Um, I wasn't the first to actually go out. I think it was the first to play a game. A game. Yeah. Sean White from, from Kerry. Sean was a Scotsman who um, moved to Kerry. His parents moved to Kerry to Lestol. Sean actually went out in February of 1983 after he had performed in the All-Ireland. He had caught some balls in the clouds in, for Kerry in the All-Ireland minor final in 1982 versus Dublin. So he had a fantastic leap, very talented guy. Sean went out in February. I was due to join him, but my dad died in February. So I went out uh, three, four months later in, in May. And Sean then subsequently that year did his cruciate. So he, his progress was, was halted somewhat. Um, and the end of the following year, the 94, 84 season, I, I played a league game. And I came back home at Christmas with a, three, with a two year contract. Um, and it was touch and go whether I would go back. And I think the draw of, you know, go back to Dermot again, it was the, the draw to play again with him and obviously to play for Roscommon uh, was too strong. Mm. Um, and again, you have to remember in those days, I was the first, the, the structure wasn't like it is now for young Irish players going to Australia where the, you know, the teams, the clubs look after the family members, they bring the parents out. And, you know, the players can go back a few times during the year. There's a lot more um, contact. It wasn't like that then. So um, there was a little bit of homesickness, no question about that. But it was that kind of, that desire and that draw, if you like, to, to, play, to play for us common. And I think the same thing um, happened, uh, happened to a couple of players who, who went out uh, subsequently. Um, uh, Kieran Kilkenny is one that comes to comes to mind. Kieran went out, I think, to Hawthorne, spent yeah. a number of months there, and realised, you know, I enjoy football and hurling better, and I want to go back and play and play for my club in my county. Uh, I really enjoyed the game, I have to say. I I, I love watching it, uh, loved playing it. Uh, but um, you make a decision, and that was the decision at the time. Any regrets? No. Once you make a decision, you stick with it, and that's it. Um, you know. Kind of final day in 85, the first year I came back, having mm. been well beaten by Mayo. If you asked me that question, I'd probably have, then I'd probably have said yes. But, um, and it took us a while to, to make a bit of a breakthrough. But um, no, no, no regrets. Okay. Um, that was all fascinating. I mean, I had no idea about a lot of that stuff. Where's Roscommon football now? 
It's in a good place. I think a really good place. Um, the work that's been done over the last number of years um, at underage level, obviously there's a, there's a really good squad there. Roscommon have won three titles, kind of titles in the, in the decade. Mm. Uh, that's very, very rare for Roscommon and obviously two in three years. So that's, that's, um, that's a big positive. Uh, great group of people, great group of people around the team and indeed supporting the team through our fundraising arm, Club Rossi, fantastic people working, working behind the scenes to raise funds to, to, to give, the, give the teams the best possible chance. I know um, you, you've been involved in coaching quite heavily, especially at club level and the international rules a couple of years ago. I heard Kevin McStay at the weekend, he was talking to Joanne Cantwell and he was saying a training session can easily cost 10,000 euro a pot, yeah. which is yeah. just eye-watering money. I mean, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it costs what it costs, but my God, that is, we, we, we're not doing things cheaply. I mean, three training sessions a week, do the maths. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's running a little bit out of control. We have to consider it is an amateur game. Um, the costs, it's, it's been fine the last couple of years. You know, the economy was going well. But we've hit a pandemic and yeah. inevitably we'll have further recessions. And when that happens, that type of expenditure just cannot take place. Mm. Um, we, just, we do really have to roll back on that. Um, it's, it is excessive, uh, particularly, as I said, for an amateur sport. Mm. What about um, the split season proposal? You, I mean, you've been involved with Selbridge and Alan Wood and, and the club game. This notion of six months club followed by six months inter-county as opposed to the kind of quasi intermingling, which has gone on for however long now at this stage. Where are you on that, Paul? Yeah. Um, I see a lot of pros. I see a lot of pros um, uh, in it. I think that separation is good in that it allows players focus on one particular team or a couple of teams if they're involved in the club. It allows the coaches uh, full access to the players. That's all good. Um, with any new structure that you bring in, you have to think of the unintended consequences. And I was talking to a couple of club players during the week who said that, you know, we're used to starting training in February, March, maybe starting our games in March, April. Uh, you know, the good weather comes, kicks in in April, the evenings are longer. You know, if we're not, not going to start until July uh, or, or August, what are we going to do in those few months? Hmm. Um, maybe, maybe there is the possibility we could lose some players to other sports. So that's an issue. Um, so I think th they would need to look at a program of games for the club players without the county players. Um, you know, before the county season ends um, in, in, in the, the latter half or the latter part of the first half of the year. Mm. Uh, for the inter-county players, it's interesting. I was talking to a couple of players actually as part of this, um, getting support for the All-Ireland Cycle. And, and we have many inter-county players and former players who are supporting the cycle and doing it, which is fantastic. But talking to a few of them during the week, the current players, they made a point that I hadn't thought of. They said, for this particular season, um, with the inter-county season supposed to start in, in October. Most of them will have started, other than Dublin and Kerry, who are in the all Final. Most of those players will have started training last October. Mm. They've had no break. Okay, they may have got a small break at the early start stages of the pandemic in, in, in maybe March or April, but they haven't got a break. So it's, it's, it's 12 months and maybe 13 and 14 months of activity right to the end of this year. That's for this year. The same applies for the, the split season. Um, that's the, the other concern I have for the inter-county player in that they're working very hard, playing a lot of games, training hard with the inter-county team, and then they're expected to do the same with the club. Yeah. So where's the break for the inter-county player? It's, uh, so I think those things have to be ironed out. Um, uh, as I said, there are some positives, and I, 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 you know, I've seen some of the media reaction and some of the players' reaction, and, and that, that is positive. But you know, um, as I said, with all of these things, you've got to look at, well, what are the downsides? And can we put in some measures in place to, to, to protect players and also to give players uh, an adequate program of games? Well, listen, it's been great talking to you. Thanks so much for coming on. Again, it's all in aid of the All-Ireland Cycle, which is now in its 10th year, and you've been there from the very start. Again, this is August 28th to September 6th, and yep. it's to raise funds for the National Breast Cancer Research Institute. It's a county v. county type scenario. Yep. There's a leaderboard. You log on. We'll see who can cycle the most across the 28th of August to the 6th of September period. And the place to go and register, allirelandcycle.ie, Paul. That's where you want people to go on and have a look and see if it, if it, uh, if it catches their interest.
Absolutely. And, and Joe, we're looking for probably three or four different groups of player, people. We're looking for the, anybody who has a bike, who's doing a bit of cycling, uh, and to take on this challenge um, of doing 200Ks over, over the, um, the 10 days. We're also looking for the cyclist who's involved in a club, or maybe isn't involved in a club, but the, who, who, who push themselves and work hard every weekend and go out for the cyclists, targeting maybe 450 or more for those cyclists and the cycling clubs. We'll also have, we'll run a leaderboard for the cycling clubs as well. And we've got great um, high number of registrations from people in cycling clubs around the country so far. Mm. Uh, families as well, um, for a family to get out. The greenways are out there, uh, cycle in a safe environment. So for a family to get together, you can actually create a, um, a team on the, on the site, on the website. So you can create a new team and you'll have a, a leaderboard for that, that team as well. So you could, you could have a competition between family versus family or cycling club versus cycling club. Right. Um, that's, that's, what, that's what we're, lo- we're looking for. And, uh, um, and hopefully as many people as possible. The generosity, I have to say, the final point I'd make to is that I'm always in awe of the generosity of the Irish uh, people. Uh, and indeed, over the last 10 years, what has um, been, I suppose, humbling to us as a group of psych- people who've, who've been involved in the cycle and inspirational as well as the number of people who have cycled for a particular cause, uh, whether it's a, a parent who has passed away from cancer or a, a, a sister or a sister-in-law or a friend who's suffering from breast cancer or a, indeed any other type of cancer, that they go out and they're doing this event and they're pushing themselves. They're taking on a challenge, an endurance challenge for somebody else. Mm. And that has been something that has been inspiring for us over the last few years. Um, people like Evan Kelly, the, the, the Meath footballer, whose younger sister, Alison, passed away early last year. And his mum and dad came with us last year for the three days. And we, you know, we, we had a dedication every day to somebody who, who has suffered or has passed away. And, and to have them with us was, was just inspirational for all of us. And, uh, and again, I think there are so many people out there who are doing different things for different charities. And that's one of the, one of the groups that we're, we're looking to hopefully get involved in this as well. If you have a cause, if you have somebody you want to, to cycle for or to support, well, th- this is an opportunity to do, to do that. And, and if people, as you rightly said, if, if people wanted to, to, to do the cycle, it's all irelandcycle.ie. But equally, if people don't, aren't able to get in a bike and want to donate, they can still go onto the website, allirelandcycle.ie, and the, there's a donate button there. Uh, as I said, all the funds go to a really worthy cause uh, at Breast, National Breast Cancer Research Institute. Great. Well, listen, it's a great thing you're doing. Best to look with it, Paul. Thanks so much. Great chatting to you. I mean, if nothing else, the image of your brother kicking a drop kick into the wind has kind of stayed. <laughs> like, you know, this, this winter <laughs> theme, and I can, I can see it now. Oh, well, you'll see, if, you, if, you, if you look on YouTube, uh, Joe, you'll see a few clips of that and, uh, and a few passes as well. Um, but uh, yeah, it may come back. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll resurrect the drop kick as a result right. of tonight's uh, Jeez, conversation. In, in this weather. Um, Paul Early, <laughs> thanks a million. Cheers. Good night, John. Thank you.